to getting involved in STEM research is to know what opportunities are out there. So we have received money from the Borough's Welcome Fund to help uh, do some career panels this spring. So this is our second career panel. And our first one was on medical and healthcare careers. So we do have a recording of that. And for different women who have different uh, pathways to medical healthcare careers was our first uh, session. Our second one is on computer science, artificial intelligence, and gaming. So that's what brings us here tonight. So the goal is that you can uh, chat questions to our panelists. And also, I'll be asking some questions to the panelists to give you some perspective on what their jobs look like, uh, what suggestions they have for those still in middle and high school about these careers and also uh, things about their pathway. Like when they were in middle school, high school, or college, what um, what matters now uh, that maybe that didn't seem that important back then that affected their career path. So uh, the people that bring us together tonight, I'll help run these uh, different research competitions uh, for students to get involved in doing uh, STEM research and then sharing it at these different events that take place in North Carolina. So uh, the people that brought this together are all involved in these different research competitions on here. So moving on, uh, what we want to hear from all participants is whether you're a parent, student, teacher, um, parent, student, or teacher, is if you want to uh, spend a minute and chat a question you're hoping will be answered by our career panelists tonight. So something you want to know about computer science, artificial intelligence, um, gaming, data. There's um, a lot of words that capture these fields of study. And uh, go ahead and let's take a minute for you to chat a question you're hoping our panelists might address tonight or a specific question you're hoping they'll answer for you. So let's give one minute for that, and then we're going to introduce our panelists. Put my timer on. And you should be able to chat so that everyone can see your question. Chris, do you want me to start helping with reading some of these questions because we're getting some good ones? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, how about we jump to our panelist introductions? One of our panelists has to leave early. So uh, we can jump to our panelist introduction and then I'm going to ask Dr. Ochoa to talk a little bit more at first and then we can hop back to some of these questions. So uh, for each panelist, just take two minutes to introduce yourselves. And uh, Dr. Cho has to go teach uh, at seven o'clock or get ready to teach at seven o'clock. So I'll throw a couple more questions at Dr. Cho first and then switch back to our other panelists for uh, some of the questions we have. So uh, let's introduce our panelists. You're going to take about two minutes each to give some background to yourself, and then we'll jump back to Dr. Cho. Oh, first, it's an honor to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm a computer science by training, but uh, I always work in the intersection between technology and education. Uh, my field is called learning analytics, that is trying to use data science to understand better the learning process and try to improve it. So what you do in the classroom, what teachers do to prepare the classes, uh, I'm trying to collect data of what happened during those processes and feedback the people that are part of that, uh, of that process so they can take action to improve it. Um, for this, I use a lot of uh, STEM-related fields from data science. I use uh, electronics to build sensors to capture this data. I use information on human-computer interaction to see how to present this information back. Um, also, the interesting part of how this 
link between technology and uh, humans, how we can make sure that we work together. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm working on. Okay, thank you. And then next, I think we have Steele. Hey, my name is Steele, and I'm in enterprise architecture, and my specific role is platform architect. Uh, so what does that mean? Heck if I know. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm mainly concerned with wise decision making and problem solving at scale. So that the health and the design of the software platform I oversee remains fit for purpose and sustainable, uh, making sure that we have the right capabilities to support our company strategy and business unit strategies. Uh, so think about it much like a house. If you keep building and building, but you don't take stock of what you have built or you have or how the new fits in with the old, over time, your house is going to fall apart uh, or relatively quickly. Uh, you also need to be able to support what you have built or designed as, and keep in mind that things change all the time. Uh, if you have a mansion, but you can't maintain it, then that mansion is going to fall apart. Your experience of living in a mansion won't be as good as it should be. Great explanation. So I'm uh, going to jump to Stacy next. Hi, my name is Stacey White Knight. Um, I'm a cisgendered uh, woman from the Dominican Republic. I actually immigrated here as a kid. Um, I also work for Red Hat. I am a senior business operations manager. Um, and that means I get to fix things that people break within the business. And check for um, 15 years. Um, about 15 years um, that I've learned and I've started in um, marketing. I moved into instructional design. I went back to school for instructional technology. I went into technical project management. I've seen all different areas of the business and, and, a, and a tech business needs everything. Um, and my background's really unique in that I've gotten to see a lot of different parts of the business. And so I get to step in and work on different projects like um, Red Hat Scale, our core business was mine to program manage from the beginning where I stepped on to corporate planning and I said, okay, this is how we have to plan this across the company. And this is how our business units have to scale. This is how our engineers will have to scale along with them. This is how our IT infrastructure will have to scale with it. This is how sales will have to go along with it too. So, um, the really neat thing about tech is you don't have to be that technical um, in your day to day. Um, and that's kind of where I come from. I'm not terribly technical, but then I find other places in my life to be technical. I'm a 3D printer by hobby. I cosplay. I do all kinds of fun, creative things. And um, and so I encourage you to take the things that interest you and bring that into your work in different ways. Great, thank you. And our final panelist is going to be David. So if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm David. I work as a uh, software engineer, um, trained as an aerospace engineer, worked in aerospace and transportation industry, essentially for about eight years. Um, and uh, just got involved in some kind of interesting projects along the way, including working with satellites um, and some aircraft analysis software, things like that, really focusing on the data processing backend components of that. And uh, at this point, my latest gig is working with autonomous vehicle infrastructure for the Federal Highway Administration. So we're actually building this infrastructure to prepare for more and more self-driving cars uh, they're coming onto the roadways. We want to make them as safe as possible. So it's kind of a really interesting developing area of technology. So yeah, great. And could you explain backend developer? So what is um, you know it's a terminology used in the tech industry. So what's that mean in the tech industry if you're a backend developer? Yeah, sure. So you might a lot of people uh, that are kind of interested in software specifically think about it in terms of apps or websites. And well, that might be how you normally interact with a, an application or piece of software. 
a lot of times for things that are a little bit more sophisticated, there's a something a separation between the front part of it that you actually interact with and the back end. Um, and you know, these days things have gone a lot more cloud, but essentially you have a server or a bunch of servers, hundreds of servers in the cloud, and uh, and actually a couple of other panelists that work at Red Hat deal with supporting that infrastructure to make the back end actually run. So I essentially we have some people that make the apps that you interact with. And then a different person like me makes the back end components. And then our Red Hat people make sure that they actually run on all the systems in the cloud at scale. Great. Well, thank you all to our four panelists. So we're going to um, move through some different questions. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Ochoa at first, but we're going to think about have them think of their college and high school pathways to what got them to where they are today and sort of the collaborative and interdisciplinary nature of who they have to work with outside of just their roles. And then we'll have some time for y'all to have questions. But since Dr. Ochoa is a professor in analytics in this field, I wanted to do a more targeted question at first is say you're a student excited about computer science or analytics or data, um, software engineering, what what choices do students need to make in high school or middle school to realize their interests versus what choices do they have to make in college? So when they show up in their first year of college, do they have to have that all figured out? Or could you explain how colleges help a tech interested student narrow down their interests? Yeah, uh, um, I, I will say that in high school, uh, middle school, high school, just keep your interest in a STEM field. So it's not that you have to specialize. I think high school is a place where you have a ground education. So go also for humanities, also for other, other, other subjects. There will be time to specialize. And something very important later in life, you, you, you will learn that these other components, these uh, arts, humanities components are actually very useful the moment that you want to apply your STEM skills. So high school, just Try to get the, the best round education possible. As I say, don't, don't, uh, don't let humanities arts aside, but also focus also the STEM. Be aware that you have to learn your math, you have to learn your physics, your chemistry. Uh, college is another story. The moment that you move into college is the moment that you have to take a kind of a first decision. I will not say a final decision, but a first decision of uh, what type of career you want to have. Um, and here you have kind of the engineering uh, side of things. Uh, being you go into electronics or you go into a special engineer or you go with other type of, um, of engineering field, you will learn some basics. Those basics could be inter interchangeable between uh, different fields. Uh, and something very important uh, and maybe was not true let's say 20, 30 years ago, but basically very true now, is that you have to keep on learning. That idea of, oh, I will go to college and I will stop learning after college. No, that's, that's not longer, not that's true anymore. You need to keep on learning. That's one of the skills that you need to, to develop more than even the STEM skills. Just learn things by yourself and being able to apply these things in your work. Great. Right. And a, a second question uh, related to the high school, college, middle school is like, um, did you have a mentor in middle school or high school or a teacher or a class that you took that shaped the career you took now? Did you know you wanted to do learning analytics when you're in kindergarten, even though that word probably didn't exist then? Like what, what happened in middle or high school that might have helped you to the pathway you're on now? I would say that there was good teachers that interests me in the STEM field. I will be okay. My family is a family of engineers, uh, but in high school, I, I knew some teachers, especially in the physics, uh, in the physics courses that were pretty good. And I say, oh, I want to do the things that this teacher is talking about. Uh, and also they talk about their life outside of school because a part of teachers, some of them were working uh, outside in their engineering careers. So. I think it's important that teachers show the things that they are able to do outside of school, especially if they have technical interests. 
uh, so they can inspire their students. Yeah, and the students pay attention to those teachers that uh, are curious, that go beyond just telling you what is in the in the curriculum, that they are interested in you to also geek like them. Great. And outside of academics, was there something in college or high school or even middle school that wasn't in the classroom that helped affect um, you taking on this type of career? So um, your soccer coach in fifth grade, like, was there something like outside of like classroom that also had an impact to, you know, confidence or knowledge about these pathways? Like you mentioned the family, uh, engineers in the family, like did that play a big role, like things outside of the classes you took? Yeah, I, I think it's it's all about uh, the, the people that you meet. That that what is uh, is important to open your horizons and and have a very diverse group of people that you communicate with. You will end up being a better whatever you are at the end. Uh, and also they provide opportunities. I think I never thought of being what I'm doing right now. I even haven't thought of working in academia when I started. Uh, but people you know, opportunities that I open, uh, somebody tell me, oh, can you help me in this course? Uh, professor told me in, 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 in college, I started in this course. That leads me to another position, that leads me to another position that at the end uh, brought me to actually end up here in, in NYU teaching uh, educational technologies. And to pull a question from the chat, and this will be the last question for um, targeted Dr. Ochoa, is um, like there's a question on like how do you transition to say a game design or development because that's a student interest. Like, do you see a lot of students show up first year they want to do game design, um, you know, video game design development, and they take classes and they move to learning analytics or they move to this or that. Like, what shifts do you see between what students are interested in? when they might start college versus how do those evolve when they finish college? I will say that in today's world, uh, we ha you have to be transdisciplinary. You, you, you move between disciplines very easily. I have, for example, people here that study uh, marketing, but right now they are developing games and probably next they are going to build learning analytics applications. So that's why I said, Having this ability to learn on your own and be flexible and say, don't be kind of, oh, I'm this, that I could move. Uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, mindset that you need to have, that be open to opportunities and to learn. And you will see that, yeah, you will be prepared for these jobs that are, are in the future that don't exist right now. How you be prepared? Being open to learn whatever it is that you need to learn at the moment. Great. So... Thank you. So I'm going to jump to some other, um, any questions for Dr. Ochoa, because he has to step away in a few minutes. I'm just looking at the chat questions real quick. Yeah, so going off, um, I think a comment Stacy had is like, uh, last question for you, Dr. Ochoa, any recommendations you'd have for middle high school students of like something they could do that they may not think about that would help enhance their interest when they, if they have an interest in computer science? Uh, the main thing is, is learn a computer, uh, computer language, whatever it is, the Python, the, uh, well, right now, what's the other popular one, Rust. Uh, learn whatever computer language you want. That was, is a key to uh, unlock a lot of opportunities, not, not just in computer science, but in related fields. Uh, so programming is one of the skills that you need to have on your belt. And second, keep updated with, with news. Yeah, the field is changing so fast uh, and the opportunities change month to month. So keep, keep up with the news on artificial intelligence and data science and just keep cur curious about the things that, uh, that the world of technologies is producing right now. Great. So thank you, uh, Dr. Cho, for being here, but you have to um, step away to teach. Uh, so um, I'm going to jump to other panels to so sort of a similar question. So I'll jump to Stacy next, then um, Steele and David of what in middle or high school mattered 
now that you have that perspective? Like what happened middle or high school that affected your trajectory now to be in a tech field? So students might worry, wow, I got to be in pre-calculus. My, my tech career is over. Like, uh, so did you worry about the wrong things when you were middle and high school? Like, was it a teacher? Was it a course? Did you, was there a certain thing you worried about that ended up not being relevant to your career in tech? Like, I'll see a lot of anxiety across students on a grade they get. You know, they may not have a computer science teacher at their school. Um, you know, a lot of students are dealing with just having substitute teachers all year in their STEM courses. So uh, I'll start with Stacy. Like, what about middle or high school ended up mattering to your tech career? Um, you know, I really had always gravitated towards um, graphics. Um, I had taken a 3D graphics class. Um, I got to say my journey is, uh, education is steeped in privilege and C plus grades. I was not a great student. Um, I excelled in random things. I was excellent at physics. I just didn't feel challenged in many other things. Um, I went to a private school in Northern Virginia that cost a lot of money. And then I went to college on a scholarship for, I was an athlete. Um, so it was an interesting journey. I, I only pick, I would only pick and choose certain things that I really enjoyed. Um, and looking back, I, um, I regret not learning how to learn. And that was the most important thing. I think out of high school was really learning how to study and to learn and think like a scientist um, and applying that through every subject. Um, and it wasn't until I went to grad school that I became a straight A student because I found my interest. And so I think if you can find your interest early and focus on that and everything else is sort of a supporting actor, then you have a leg up, but you may not know what you want to do. So um, I encourage you to be curious and, um, explore a lot of different things. Um, Dr. Ochoa was saying sort of the same thing, like get outside of your comfort zone and, and find those things that make you uncomfortable. I was really bad at 3D. I was really bad at the 3D design. I ended up um, doing a little bit more of that in early in my career with design. Um, and um, that kind of has stuck through. It permeates like everything that I do in business operations is beautiful. Like uh, everything I design, you know, put together, it looks really great. It's readable um, and that sort of thing. So the principles have stuck through that. Um, and that's, that's the best advice. Take what you really love and know and go from there. You can't, I don't, I'm not a believer in like working on a weakness. It's just not your strong point. Take your strong points and soar to the highest points that you can accept that you're not going to be good at everything and excel to, you know, your like <laughs> excel as much as you can at the things that you're great in. Great. So jumping to steel, like, did you also find like grades didn't represent your interests or um, something else sort of brought you to the college environment? So with, um, for Stacy, it was actually athletics that, you know, led to a scholarship to get to the college environment. So for steel, like what, happened with you in middle or high school that had some impact to your tech career? Did someone grab you in seventh grade and say, learn Python? Like what, what happened that sort of led to this interest now? Man, this is, a, this is a, a big question. If I had one word of advice, it would be to wear sunscreen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, uh, my fascination with tech started very early. Uh, like, hmm, so uh, I started gaming probably before I was five, before kindergarten. Uh, it was like yeah, Super Mario 64 or something at a friend's house or something. It's probably even babysitting and dropped off. Um, and uh, so technology was always one of those things that I felt like I could one, it was fascinating. It was fun. Games were built with technology and, and gaming was really fun. It was also something that I felt like I could control. You, you can figure out or at least predict what an outcome might be. Uh, I went to seven different schools in seven different states by the time I was in seventh grade. So there was not a lot of 
my life that was really consistent. Um, but technology was something I could keep learning. Uh, I remember uh, I found this, I was really fascinated with the, the puzzle of technology. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call remembers Backtrack Linux, it's now Kali. Uh, but before it was Kali, it was Backtrack. And um, uh, I have to be careful of my words here. You can do some very interesting things with forensics, uh, Linux distributions. And uh, so to be able to solve the puzzle of, hey, what's the password to log into a computer was very interesting. And uh, that was supplemented with uh, is a TV show is called Tech TV. And then there's G4 and then G4 Tech TV. And that was just heaven in sixth grade because it was all technology all the time. That's where I learned about Firefox. That's where it was a new browser at that time. And, and Chrome had just come out. Uh, you had Kevin Rose, Alex Albrecht, who started, they were doing a podcast and then Kevin went to Google Ventures. Like, talk about those career paths. Um, so technology for me started very early and it was really necessity for kind of handling the environment that I was in. And once I got to middle school and high school, my environment settled a little bit and I was uh, able to actually start focusing and thinking about what is it that I want to do? What a weird question to be asked in like seventh grade, what do you want to do? Um, and I don't think anyone really knows what they want to do. Um, but I will uh, say that the advice of being exposed to different technologies, to different things is really important. Unless you're exposed and you try it, you don't know if you're going to like it or not. And you may not like it, uh, but come back to it later and like it uh, at a different point in your life. You just may not be ready for it now. Um, uh, the uh, Stacy mentioned something uh, about not being technical, but still being in the tech field. Uh, for those of you that are on this call that uh, are into, I saw the question about gaming. Um, you've got uh, art, you've got music, um, there's so many different aspects of how to create a video game that uh, even if you're not, if programming is not your thing, there's still other things that you can do to get into the gaming industry. And the other thing that I would say is just do. Pick something up and learn it. Go to YouTube, look at YouTube tutorials. You can watch someone else try it out and see if it looks interesting or not. But someone can, uh, in this day and age, and hold you through whatever it is you're interested in learning on YouTube. So you don't, don't wait, just do. Try and, and build something, anything, no matter how basic or, or generic it is, and then just iterate on it slowly or build up a portfolio. Because that portfolio of experience that you'll have built through middle school and high school is going to be incredibly valuable to anyone who interview you, interviews you or to any company that you apply that you've already got experience in the things that you want to do. That is going to put you uh, in a spotlight anywhere that you interview. So don't wait, just do. Make sure you take advantage. Um, in terms of things that don't matter, well, I'll, I'll start with one thing that, that really does. Um, it's it's learning. You have to constantly learn it. It doesn't stop. Uh, you're you're going to, if you keep going down these fields, getting certifications after you're out of college are, are like your new degrees. They're they're really beneficial. They're, they're helpful, but it's the learning that matters. If you truly understand the concept and you can apply it, that is incredibly important. Um, I failed the calculus three times, two times, two times in a row. Yeah, pre-calc and then calculus in a row. That's embarrassing. I was so embarrassed. Uh, and I ended up taking my, my first ever summer course uh, was calculus. <laughs> and um, I did end up passing, which was great. And I think that we are all our own hard, hardest or worst critics uh, when it comes to some of these things. And you're going to find that in the corporate world, in the professional world, you're, 
life looks a little different. You may not be the best or the fastest or, or, or the most intelligent, but you've got to be the most persistent. You've just got to keep trying. And as long as you are able to learn and as long as you're persistent and you don't give up, I think you will find uh, success and you'll be successful. Great. So Steel failed calculus. Stacy was a C student. Um, so David was, what did your, how did your middle high school life look um, of, did everything line up that um, you, you had teachers who taught you things that were helpful to this career field. You had courses in it. Um, you were successful in your courses. Like what, what your pathway look like? Uh, I guess what's aligned with what Stacy um, and Steele already mentioned versus how your pathway is a little different. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think there are a couple of uh, items to note, you know, I definitely want to go off of, um, of, of what Steele and Stacy are saying that it is very important to be passionate about uh, what you're interested in. You know, so in my experience, um, yeah, I was always interested in math and science and things that take a lot of thinking and analysis. And that's just kind of in my personality. I think, you know, my family background kind of informed uh, a lot of my interest in engineering specifically. You know, my father and grandfather worked in radio, um, setting up antennas, things like that, uh, worked in computers and kind of inspired an interest in that for me. Uh, just kind of curious about how uh, computers and electronics worked, but um, yeah, just technology in general. And then I think at one point they took me on a test flight uh, for my 16th birthday, which was really a lot of fun. So we got to fly an airplane and, you know, it's a big machine. It's really complicated. There are a lot of different moving parts of it. And so to try and understand the calculations that went into designing an airplane was something that I became particularly interested in. So, but there are just so many different aspects of, uh, of vehicles and engineering that I kind of found were really interesting to me personally, and I got very curious about. So just, you know, from reading books, uh, paying attention in class, those kind of things, asking questions from the people who I knew were engineers was just a really good way to sort of continue to develop an interest in that. You know, I think, um, yeah, being passionate about something uh, kind of focused like that is really important. And I think looking back, um, there were a lot of the other classes. For me, my path was actually very strong in math and sciences. So I got really, really good grades in those most of the time, not always. Uh, but the the other classes were a real struggle for me. So especially history and English just ended up not being my strong suits. And that was definitely a real struggle for me. Um, so I think it is still important, though, to really uh, sometimes we kind of have to slow things down instead of trying to to go fast. It helps to actually slow things down and pay attention to what people are trying to teach you. And I think that has come back a little bit later. There's also sort of a trajectory, a little bit of a change in your career as you go through. Um, some people are happy doing exactly the same thing consistently. And I've been largely that way, but there have been uh, times when I, I, I started to have an interest, I've developed new interests along the way and gone in slightly different directions. So having a little bit of a broader foundation uh, of, in terms of knowledge and paying attention and learning and asking questions is a very important thing. And um, so I'd definitely say focus in what your passion is, but don't neglect the need to learn a bit of a broader foundation. You know, and going into software specifically, I think it's a one of the most important fields uh, 
just these days, and it's one of the more rapidly growing ones, just the way that it it's a very unique field. It's able to develop extremely rapidly, much faster than anything that's hardware bound. So there's a lot of change and that's kind of something you have to get used to. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really good area to go after and I would encourage anyone that is interested in that to look for tutorials. There are a lot of you know, free ones online and also in that make sure that you kind of broaden your horizons about what you think about um, and what you study because just focusing in one language is a lot of times not something that you're is able to cut it. So learning a couple of different languages, a couple of different ideas are important. And specifically in software, learning your foundations is also something that's very important. That's when you learn in um, a real computer science school. So uh, we can talk a little bit more about some kind of tips and tricks for uh, where to find you know, good places and good learning resources. But, um, you know, overall, that's that's what I would say. And, uh, and my path has been um, pretty consistent in terms of just being a software engineer. But along the way, I have gone to a couple of different companies and there are opportunities to do that. So, yeah. So real quick follow-up question to everyone is, um... You're going to keep this short, but first, Stacy, when you were around 16, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Um, I was, uh, I thought I was going to be on the U.S. women's soccer team. I played soccer and I was really good. Um, I was on my way to, you know, UNC Chapel Hill right after Mia Hamm, like, um, and then I actually broke both of my kneecaps and that was a dead dream. I had to find something else to do. Um, and that, that is, uh, I, I play again and I coach now, but, uh, it was a pretty bad injury and I ended up picking up a golf club and being pretty good at that. So I ended up getting a full ride to college to do that. And, um, I, like I said, I was not very academic as a kid. Um, and I didn't know at the time, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college, to go to college. Um, and I didn't know, I, you know, I, I think this is great advice that I heard earlier, David, I'm not sure. I think you said it is to kind of pay attention to the advice around you. I did not have that. Um, I didn't have people around me telling me to excel at academics. I just sort of followed along with everyone else and found a group of people that I really loved in college and um, didn't know what I was doing. And I wish I had mentors. I wish I had coaches um, guiding me along the way to say, hey, you're actually pretty good at this kind of tech stuff or you have these skills and you should develop them. I, I didn't have that. Um, I, I didn't know that I was good at it at the time. Um, I, even though I enjoyed it a little bit, I didn't have anyone pushing me in that direction. So um, I think that's really great advice. Often, you know, if I look back, you know, even at that age, maybe I wouldn't have listened to it anyway. Um, but when someone tells you that you have a talent or you might have an interest, um, keep an open mind to that. Um, it's It could be something and it, it may lead to an open door down the road that you may really, really love. Um, so, yeah. Great. And before I jump to steel, like David pointed out, tips or tricks. So for David, Stacy, if you want to start chatting, maybe some tips or tricks, whatever that mm -hmm. looks like to you, of resources students should follow, find, learn. Uh, well, I throw the same question at steel is like when you're 16-ish, like, is this what you imagine you'd be when you grew up or do you have some different thoughts? Is that question open to me now? Yeah, for steel, yeah. Uh, I think I overshot a little bit, actually. Uh, so, and I would have told you this in seventh grade, and I was asked this question, similar question in seventh grade, what do you want to be? Uh, and I wanted to be a programmer. I want to be a developer. I wanted to write software. I want to help people. And I did actually achieve that goal. And I got to, um, I actually, I think I, I skipped the part about the career path. Um, but I did, act, I, I made it to senior developer. Um, 
an insurance company. Uh, but I actually, I, I started, so out of college, I started in the mail room, but I was still working in IT. I was on the help desk and it was strange. I would go to the mail room in the morning and I got to memorize where all the attorneys sat. And uh, then after mail was done, I'd, I'd go uh, to help desk. And I think that that was not necessarily, uh, they didn't intend for it to go on so long as like nine months or something like that. They're like, what are you still doing to get up here? Um, and uh, at that point, uh, I moved into system engineer. So after learning the ins and outs, um, essentially becoming more skilled in communication, more skilled in understanding how different components and parts work together to be able to achieve business outcomes uh, and why you use certain um, technologies, like what those technologies do. Uh, there was so much that I didn't understand about email, about servers, about how they're used, uh, business continuity, uh, redundancy. Now, once you get into the corporate environment, you start learning about those things. Uh, it was not, uh, it's it's practical at that point. Uh, then from there, I went to, and this is strange, uh, I did do development um, as a system engineer, and then I went to manager of application development, and then I transitioned to another job, and you'd think I would have went to management, but no, there was a role that was open for a senior developer. And so went that way. It's kind of maybe backwards, not so straightforward. And then from senior developer, platform architect. Um, so I've got over 10 years of experience in IT, and I don't want to date myself. I think there's some bets going on right now in chat. And um, uh on the software platform uh, that I'm the architect for, I have over seven years of experience. So I've been doing a long time implementations, um, lots of experience there. So <laughs> start young. That was, yeah, start young. Um, so you didn't dream of the mailroom yeah. job when yeah. you were in seventh grade. Yeah, I, I didn't dream of the mailroom. Uh, that was a little depressing. Um, but again, it's that persistence uh, and that focus. I always wanted to do programming, so I at least had an advantage from that standpoint. I knew where I wanted to be. I didn't know how I was going to get there or that this crooked path I was on actually led to where I wanted to go, which is really cool. Great. And for David, like what you imagine in seventh grade, I guess, yeah, seventh grade is when they do careers or maybe by 10th grade, like, is this what you thought you'd be or do you have different ideas of like this is what I'll be when I grow up yeah you know I was a little bit confused um because I really had an interest in being a pilot uh just really wanted to kind of yeah just fly airplanes I thought that'd be super awesome but I wasn't really sure how I was going to balance that against kind of the more analytical side of myself you know I think like that fast paced action and having to deal with all the radio calls, and just tons of information coming at you, I think was really interesting, but I have a little bit more of an analytical mind. So that was kind of the route that I ended up choosing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I ended up pretty much where I thought I'd be. Um, yeah, for the most part, I have found opportunities that I guess I didn't really anticipate, but that, that just, happened because I kind of went in with an open mind, you know, looking for the interesting projects that I can be part of. And, and I've had the privilege of be able to jump into a number of small research and development projects uh, at different companies, different research labs, locations, doing interesting work in a, a similar industry uh, pretty consistently. So yeah, just going in with an open mind, it's a journey. And that's something that you can really have to look forward to. Great. Um, and Stefania, you had a question you wanted to throw out? Well, we kind of move on past middle and high school. I know. And looking at the chat, there's some great questions as well as some great comments. Um, I love what Stacy is bringing about. And 
I'm surprised David hasn't spoke a little bit about it. Um, Stacy mentioned um, making sure that we get some form of financial literacy, learning about how to manage your money. And um, David, I don't even think you brought that part up, how you stop tech for a while to go into learning about uh, finance and how you started developing in that area. So you may wanna speak to that a little bit too, but the, all these intricate skills that we're speaking about may not seem like it's more technical related, but it is as it helps you to develop and grow. We're talking about uh, professional development. We're talking about pers um, uh, speaking skills. And now we're even adding in uh, finance. So either you all can, any of you all can speak on that for the them, how that all plays a part into this. And David, tell them a little bit about what made you stop one path and go on into another. Yeah, sure. Well, there are Definitely one thing that I got interested. So this comes down to kind of a little bit of a um, uh, change and just, again, being open-minded to various opportunities. And the path that you take in your career doesn't have to be straight. You know, so at some point I did get pretty interested in um, just as part of the backend systems I was developing I noticed that financial systems were also, you know, operating on some of the similar principles. I kind of looked into it and also got a little bit interested. So, yeah, that is definitely something I consider as a, a almost a uh, passion, but definitely a very strong side hobby uh, that I'm interested in a little bit outside of my career, but I have given serious consideration to kind of going in that direction. Um, and, and that was actually one of the companies I worked for at one point for a brief time. So uh, yeah, I mean, you can apply your skills in this field of software engineering. You can apply them to really a lot of different industries, a lot of different places. And you see, you start to really see patterns in the way that systems have to be designed. And yeah, you can apply your skill set in a lot of different areas. And also the problem solving methodology that you develop for yourself is something that is also very translatable and, and something that's in demand. So when companies are trying to hire you, they're actually looking at a lot more than just your basic skill set. So, you know, that's another thing that we could really get into also is recruiting and hiring becomes um, a little bit of an interesting conversation, but there's long story short, there's more to getting a job and building your career than just uh, checking off boxes on a checklist. There being a little bit more of a broad skilled person can open new doors to you. Great. And since you're all mentioning like, um, or something you mentioned finances of like learning how to budget, how to finance, like, um, Computer science, AI, gaming are also popular because it's a field where students will think, wow, I'll make a lot of money. So uh, how has that shaped like your entry into this field? Like, have you seen it affected jobs you chose to take or apply for or not to take? Um, uh, would you agree between you and other peers, you know, of like, yes, this is a field that uh, because of the compensation it offers um, is definitely very rewarding and can help you support other interests you might have outside of your tech career. So how, with kind of dollar signs being one reason students might have interest in this field, how have you seen that shaped um, your pathways to this field or your peers? So I can, I'll jump to Stacy first. Sure, money is everything. <laughs> money talks. Uh, it's a, you know, I, I just, you know, going back to it's it's a very lucrative um, business. Not all of them pay the same, right? Like you see, like Meta and um, you know companies like Google pay really, really well. It's a little imbalanced, you know, with certain companies. The money is everything at the end of the day. It. I don't do that, you know. <laughs> like you can love your job all you want, but if it doesn't pay you well enough, like you're not going to stick with it. Um, and at the same time, if you really want that lucrative job, you have to kind of 
tackle, lean into what David is saying and be dynamic and have different experience, bring different, you know, these companies are innovative because they have, for the most part, diversity of thought, diversity of experience, um, diversity of community, most, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially in certain areas, you just don't see innovation um, without having those type of experiences. I mean, if you think about it, like, in your own life, if you're eating, you know, the same thing every day, and then you're given a whole bunch of exotic ingredients on your table to prepare something fun for dinner, you're just not going to know what to do. So you have to experiment with different things, you know, push yourself out of your comfort zone, so that when someone does lay out all the ingredients for you to create and be innovative, when you're in that kitchen, you're going to be like, boom, I have no idea what this is going to taste like, but let's just start, let's just start creating. And that's the same, you know, it's the same with the kitchen as it is with an organization that they're trying to get as many different experiences um, and people and thoughts and, and perspectives within their creative circles to be innovative. And when you can bring that to the table, you've made yourself extremely marketable and you can put some weight in behind your ask for that money. Great. And for David, like how has like the potential compensation where you could work for a Google or Meta or students might pursue this field because they know it pays well um, ahead of what their interest in the field might be. So have you seen that shape peers you've had to work with or yourself? Yeah. And, and what Stacey's saying is absolutely right. You know, I, I think that there's, um, yeah, I, it is one of the reasons that it is more of an in-demand field is because there are a lot of parts of it that are challenging, you know, a lot of times. So I would also add that you really need to look at your personality. And if you're someone that was really interested naturally in going after these challenges and this is an interest that aligns with your passions um, or you think it could, uh, give it a try and and just go ahead and get started, uh, do some sample projects and, and kind of learn more and more about it that you can. Um, and it, I guess I would encourage people not to get too hung up on the compensation part of it. It's definitely uh, something that should factor into your decision-making about which career to pursue and which jobs to accept, where to move. So it's an important thing to consider, but what's really most important is what you're passionate about, what you enjoy, um, if you have that option uh, to find something that you're you're excited to go do every day. Um, that's the, the type of role you'll be able to uh, work with at a pretty high level and actually deliver. It'll be uh, a good experience. You can actually you know, participate. If you're doing a career that you're not passionate about, you know, even if you're able to kind of figure out how to write some code or how to do some certain engineering problems or something like that, or if you end up getting into this field, but in a role that just doesn't work all that well for you, um, you're going to find that the money is not something that's going to be able to motivate you. So you really do have to find what you're passionate about. And, and that's ultimately what it really comes down to, in my opinion. Okay, and for steel, you have your red hat on. Um, so kind of on compensation, but also brand. Um, you know, for middle or high school students are gonna hear of um, like Epic Games, Meta, Google, Tesla, like brand names that represent tech. So uh, how much does that brand name, how much does that brand name matter to you to wanting to work for one of those large brands? Like how much does that matter in tech? Like. Is that where all the money's at and opportunities at, or is that not quite what it looks like when you're actually looking for a career once you're out of college? This question right here uh, probably will be correctly answered by everybody on the call. This is just to say that there's more than one right answer uh, and your individual mileage may vary. Uh, I will say that there are some companies that have brand recognition 
And with that brand recognition, you've got two ends of the spectrum. You've got the part of the brands where, yes, there will be roles that are very highly paid and they will take good care of folks. And if that is, is what you're looking for, awesome. You will also have, again, well-known brands that may not take as well care of the people that uh, are wanting to work there. Um, and that's, again, because of brand recognition, they can, they can do that. Uh, so you have a responsibility to yourself to make sure that you take care of yourself and that you are um, uh, that you're being appreciated, uh, that you are putting in the efforts that you are supposed to put in, uh, and that you're working hard. Um, from a, and this is, might be where my opinion differs a little bit. Um, hmm. So if the only thing that you're working for is the dollar, then whoever pays you the most next is going to be your next employer and you're going to hop over. And that has some downsides. Uh, there's some plus, there's some pros and cons. Uh, one is that you're never really going to build a reputation or see something to fruition if you keep hopping to different places every year. Um, and at some point, you've got a resume that's long, it looks varied, but your depth of experience and knowledge is, is low. It's not very deep. And um, for, for example, um, I, I can't think of, I don't know if there's ever been a place I only stayed at for a year. Um, it's multiple years. And I've been able to partner and build partnerships and build relationships and have those deep connections with the folks that I'm working with. And that is invaluable. Um, the, that human connection is worth more than money, in, in my opinion, because that's how you get mentors. That's how you find new opportunities. Uh, that's how you build yourself. Um, and there is a and I, I'm sure folks have, have gone to Google, but there, there's a limit to how much money can actually make you happy. There, there's, it's only one part of the equation. You have your mental health, you have your family. Are you excited to get out of bed every day when you do these things? And it's a combination of all those that you have to figure out what the balance is in, in order to uh, feel successful, I, I guess. Um, we've seen that very successful, at least on the outside, uh, either famous or not famous. Um, they've had very tragic lives, even though money wasn't a concern. Like they, uh, yeah. Um, and so the, the second part of your question is brand everything. No, brand is not everything. There's a ton of companies out there that you've never heard of that are making moves that all the, all the folks in the media are, are um, all those big brands are making. You just don't know they exist. Um, professional service companies, um, different AI companies, different gaming companies, the space changes frequently. Um, so you may have your heart set on uh, one specific company and you may not get accepted or they may reject you or the interviewer has a bad Friday. And um, that is not the end of your career. One, you can keep trying, you can be persistent. There's a ton of opportunity out there. There's a lot of opportunity. Build those relationships, build human connection, and those opportunities are going to come to you. Forgot I muted my, my dog was barking. <laughs> um, so I ask that because I see parents of students sometimes drive um, students' identity of what success looks like, sometimes more than what the students are identifying as success. That's why I wanted to throw that question out there. So one thing I wanted to do is I'm chatting a link to a Jamboard 
uh, for students to fill out while I throw out one more question so that our panelists can respond to um, anything that you type here. So if you're not familiar with Jamboard, at the top, you can arrow over to the next slide. So our panelists have thrown some questions out for y'all to answer. And I wanted to give a little bit of time before we get to eight o'clock that um, you can start typing uh, your responses here so our panelists can respond to them. So again, the way the Jamboard works, you should be able to edit by, if you go over to the left, you can click the sticky note icon and click anywhere on the screen. I'm not sure how it looks on a mobile device and put a sticky note on the screen to answer the question. And at the top is a arrow button that lets you arrow to each question in the Jamboard. So that's something you all as an audience can start chatting about um, over the next 10 minutes while I ask some prompts just about kind of the collaborative interdisciplinary nature of what work looks like in this field. So we asked that same question to our medical healthcare people a week ago, like what's collaboration, how interdisciplinary is your field? And we wanted to ask that to y'all and Stefania, anything else I'm missing before I hop to this? Yeah, I wanted to make sure we answered a few of the questions that were in the chat. Like I'm going back to Judith's question, but she asked about some transitioning into game design and development. So I wanted to see if anyone had some insight for her about that, for one. Sure. Oh. So. Steele, you might have a little bit better an answer. I was just going to say, um, Go ahead, David. but there are training programs out there for that. And these days, there are these things called boot camps, which actually that's an, part of another question where you can get good education. Um, you know, I think kind of the strongest education is still going to be a computer science degree from a four year. Uh, you can get a lot also of the foundational training from community college. That's a, a very valid option. And there are these new programs called boot camps that a lot of people have had uh, a lot of success with. So they're a little bit shorter term, like usually about six months long, and they teach you very hands on and very quickly. But and they just, it's something where you have to jump in and just start programming right away, and they teach you by learning. Um, so it's a valid option. You do miss out on some of the other foundational aspects of computer science specifically, but Steele, I'm curious about your perspective. So, oh, um, let's see here. So two things, uh, one is very thematic and on point here. Uh, you may, your pathway to that career is probably not gonna be straight. One, it's very competitive and it's probably not gonna be straight. What I would recommend is try and get in at a company where that is their product and that is their focus. Um, but you don't have to start out as a game developer. Think about Riot Games, for example. They have other areas that Stacy would be familiar with, uh, such as marketing and information technology, HR. There's all these different um, stepping stones to get into the company. And then once you're in the company, you start building those relationships you start going to those community of practices, those meetups, and you start meeting people in the company and you figure out, um, it, one, you can get a mentor that actually works at that company. And two, uh, companies usually have a like cross training program of some sort. So then you can say you're interested in being a game developer and then there you go. So that's uh, that's one thing that'd be on, on the theme of pathways. Um, and then the second thing is it, for an industry that is as competitive uh, as game uh, development, uh, one, get a good therapist. You're probably going to need it. No. Um, uh, just make sure you take care of yourself in, in terms of your, your time commitments. Um, uh, let's see. I'm losing my train of thought here. What was I going to say? Um, so uh, for the second part, uh, oh, no, I'm losing it. And I'm out of coffee, this is bad. Um, oh, right, 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 right. So for something that is competitive like that, you, again, you need to build up a portfolio of work. You need to go to all the meetups, go uh, and find out where people 
the people that work at the place that you want to work at, where are they going? Are they going to meetups? Can you potentially meet someone? Can you reach out on LinkedIn? Um, and just get out there. Put yourself out there. It's going to be scary. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to give you a, a, a chance. It's going to give you an opportunity. Nothing is guaranteed. That's all I'd say about that. And, and take risks. Yeah. For things that are yeah. uncomfortable. I mean, that's just one of the most, you know, the times that I have kind of um, stepped up to do something that is a little bit uncomfortable, turns out to, to be a really good experience overall. So take risks, even if you're scared that it might not work out. And I'm get, uncom to, get I'm uncomfortable being comfortable. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pop in the question that Judith asked up top, if one of the panelists would take a look at it and maybe give her some more in-depth answer to it. That way you don't have to take it up here. And you just rechatted it. Yeah. Okay. Python. Yeah, so I guess, does this even matter? Like, does a student need um, this foundation at the high school, middle school level? Um, I think that's if so, what David Python. was saying earlier. Python's a great one, right? It's really popular, but it's not going to be what it is in a couple of years. You know, like it's changing and it is. I mean, I think we've said it, there's a thread here that we've said it in different ways, you know, like learning how to learn, learning a passion um, and sticking with it. It's learning how to think like a scientist, scientific thinking. It is more about that, your interest, your curiosity, your willingness to dive into something new. You might know Python today, but what is it going to be in five, 10 years? when you need to use a, a language in your job, it's probably not going to be that. So it's more about um, learning how to be curious, learning where to go to find these new skills. Um, I, I have a, um, you know, I started my technical, my technology in, um, you know, 3D, graphics didn't touch it again for years and it wasn't until i had you know and i'm attending a meetup next week for unreal engine and learning how to develop there to get back into into game design and that sort of stuff because it crosses over with 3d printing i never would have taken 3d printing up had i not had a son born with one hand and i wanted to learn how to make prosthetics and that requires some really technical skills and so i taught myself that. And I will say that the barriers to learning technology are tremendous. There are tremendous barriers to learning technology. So if you learn how to find and break down those barriers and be brave and courageous and be in uncomfortable spaces for a little while while you're learning how to do that, that's what you need. It's not learning how to the particular language of today, I think. Um, it's changed so much, you know, since I've stepped on into, into tech, I've never really stuck with one myself. I've learned how to do HTML and HTML5 and C plus, but then I moved into other areas, but I can pick it up really quick because I know how to learn and I know where to go for, for that knowledge. I know where to find mentors and people to teach me. And that's how you overcome those barriers. You're on mute, Chris. And learn Python. And learn Python. I I only learned that because I was 3D printing. And then I took that back into my workplace to do data analysis and learn how to do Tableau and all that other stuff. So what you would what I was doing outside of work, I brought right back into work in different ways. Yeah, definitely learning how to learn learning where to go to find the, um, the knowledge that you need is really important um and so you know also 
what you find with software also going a little bit more fundamental. I also want to kind of put this out there a little bit too, that there's a lot of value in uh, just learning the simple things first. And again, a little bit more of a foundation that you're forming. So learning a language like C++, that's uh, a pretty low level thing, I think, in conjunction with learning a language that's uh, that's also very powerful and, and easy to make more powerful solutions like Python, uh, can those two things can actually help play off each other uh, and really supplement your learning and give you a broader base. Um, and, you know, I don't think that everyone will necessarily agree with my perspective on that, but I think that there's something to be said for learning some of the fundamentals of almost how computers work, but how software works at a low level, like with C++, as well as learning the fundamentals in uh, languages that are a little bit easier to start with as well. Great, and something I've seen uh, from working with our students at CSM is surprisingly like Python and R, the letter R, which is sort of a visualization software, is often one of the more requested skills across all research disciplines. So whether they're in linguistics or um, STEM fields or non-STEM fields, uh, one thing I've seen is like a basic foundation. And that is helpful because often the professor may not know it well or the grad students and um, kind of that basic level is needed so that you can do some of whatever work they're doing is something that has surprised me. Um, for the interdisciplinary nature, so Steele, um, did, so Steele, do you work remote only in your role um, or do you have an office to get into? So I am 100% remote, uh, but I have met my colleagues uh, in person. Uh, that opportunity is about once, twice a year. So project work. for you is sort of a stereotype of the programmer that just, um, you know, is in isolation, like how much are you collaborating with other people with a CS background? And how much are you also collaborating with people that are um, somewhat like Stacy, like they're immersed in what you do, but they're not there as a programmer as their lead role or software engineer? Uh, so I pretty much just shut the lights off. I turn on Netflix and no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> most of the day, and I, I think this will be a challenge that everyone will, everyone deals with uh, at some point is uh, protecting your time. So when I say that, I don't mean ignore people. That's, that's not the point. Uh, I spend most of my day in meetings, uh, interfacing with various different folks um, folks in my immediate area, um, folks in HR, folks in portfolio management, uh, in, in different areas. So all different areas. It's not just interfacing with programmers. Uh, it's not just development. Uh, it's it's cross-functional. Even uh, in development, uh, you're going to work with different stakeholders. Uh, you'll probably be involved in workshops. And you'll be working with people that are not programmers. And so you'll have to be able to articulate to them what, how your solution or how your thought process is going to solve their problem in the most uh, efficient and effective way. And collaboration is absolutely necessary. Uh, you can do your homework and get all the questions that you need answered so that you can block some time to get, to get your work done and work on it. You will not be able to get to as an effective or correct a right of an answer without the input of others. Uh, especially at the architect level, uh, there's rarely anything that I do that I don't depend on someone else for some sort of feedback or, or uh, a starting point. Uh, it, there, it's just too complex. And uh, if I did get to an answer and I did not take someone else's viewpoint into account, I probably got to the wrong answer. 
because they would have, they will, anyone else on this call will probably think of something different than I thought of. And that's something that I need to take into account. So it's absolutely collaborative. Great. And something I see from us being a statewide high school is some students are at schools that are very hyper competitive, including NCSM, where uh, students see each other as competition. Um, yeah, you know, of that's competition for getting into a top school, and other students will be kind of a drought, like they're the only student interested in programming at their school, like there's no one else like them. Um, it's a bit all over the place. So I'm wondering, um, maybe the third to Stacy, like, how much do you see maybe people come in that have like the tech skills, like they may have been the A students, and they're excellent with their coding, but you see them get tripped up because they don't have the other skills that like Steele was mentioning. Um all the time, <laughs> um, especially when I was working as a product manager. Uh, there are so many, there are so many other skills that you need to have to be successful um, in the business space. And I, I mentioned this earlier in chat and I cannot stress it enough, is to network, network, network. Um, there are all different types of people that work in a company and i recognize that some people are more introverted than others but even as an introvert um even as someone who may not be from the united states or here or you know may not be comfortable it is so important to learn how to network and learn business etiquette to learn like just basic things that can help you be successful um and through that you can also find you know a mentor or a sponsor. And that is just so important um, as you come into, as you go into a workspace, especially as you're coming out of college, um, it can help you navigate things a lot faster um, and learn a lot quicker, learn the ropes, you know, of, of a business um, and to sort of navigate the company politics, which are real no matter where you go, <laughs> that they're just there. Um, I see people get really flustered with not being as academic, you know, you don't learn these skills in academic um, of how to, to function in a business, um, you know, and that's a lot of things, not only like finance and networking, there's just a lot of other things as well that you can only really learn by doing and failing. And that's a big thing. Yeah. Collaboration. We learn a little bit of that at, at school, right. But we don't know, necessarily what project collaboration looks like in a workplace and how important trust is. Trust is essential um, to especially open source collaboration. Um, you know, and, and there's just a lot of things that tack on to a lot these like bigger concepts like collaboration and being agile that you just don't learn in school and you just have to learn by doing and failing. Thank you. And David, like right before the start of the session, we talked about um, tractor trailers, um, kind of self-driven uh, was like a project you're working on to kind of test out some of the technology you're working on. So getting into like politics, especially since you're working with the federal government, like what are some of the barriers that you've seen trip people up because they think it's just programming or they just think it's just software engineering? And now you have a tractor trailer going down Interstate 95. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the most important things that I've seen is for people to be a team player. Just it, it's all about having the right attitude because that kind of the way that you approach uh, working with other people governs the way you're going to approach solving problems, uh, and and also how robust your solutions are going to be the quality of those solutions and the safety. So it all really does come down to how you work with other people. Uh, so I'd say, you know, there's, again, just having a, a little bit of a larger knowledge base um, or information about people in different fields, uh, even, you know, silly as it sounds, knowledge of history, uh, and all this classes that you may or may not like that you have to take now, you know, are forming that 
foundation for you to be able to be conversational and with other people that are in very different job roles from you, very different industries from you, uh, and, and also collaborating with them and, and understanding their perspectives. So you know, not, everything that we do ultimately comes down to people because it's, it's the people designing the systems that really matter, no matter what the industry is, no matter what thing you're designing. So I would really say, um, I suppose where people could get tripped up is trying to stay a little bit too siloed. I've seen that in a number of places and, you know, that works for them uh, to a large extent. And you know, I think a lot of people that uh, are, are a little bit less interested in collaboration can be happy to an extent, but they will not have nearly as many of those growth opportunities. If they're not engaging in networking, they're not going to have those kind of growth opportunities. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say keep an open mind, be conversational with people, be collaborative, be proactive. You know, um, project managers love when they hear somebody step up to the plate and say, hey, I, I see that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done for a project or to meet some kind of deadline. So I just wanted to say I'm here to help. Thanks. And a simple question to end with is, uh, and do we have any chat questions I'm missing? Is kind of the basic level of working with high school students. A thought is, is this going to be boring or will I fail? Like might be the questions rattling around in their minds. So do you feel like computer science, like through your pathways, it will give students a good foundation, even if they decide it's not for them? or it's boring or they find out they hit a barrier in a certain class that might have to shift directions. Um, is this still a field you'd say, yes, you could, you definitely should still pursue it because it can take you in so many diverse directions. I mean, I would say yes. Um, yeah, still, you want to go ahead? Uh, mm. So, I will say if I had to weigh my underwater basket weaving uh, experience versus computer science, um, I will probably, even if I was more passionate about English or maybe even psychology, or I changed my mind and I want to be a doctor, uh, computer science will, uh, you can take that and apply it to so many different fields the thought process, the thinking, the programming, how can I take even just process automation? How can I take something that is a pain point or tedious and rearrange the parts uh, of this puzzle so that it flows better or it works better? And basket weaving, I can only get so far. I can maybe buy a machine, but with computer science, you can build the machine. You can figure out how that machine works. Uh, it's amazing how much the, even the human body or science DNA, how much that I, I see programming kind of in that field. Um, there was this one story of a uh, his computer scientist. I think he actually taught uh, at a college and his son was born with an extremely rare disease and doctors could not figure out what was wrong uh, with, uh, with his son. Uh, couldn't figure it out. Uh, and he was able to apply computer science and figure out what was wrong. I th it was something genetic, I think, or something with the cells. Was able to figure it out where doctors couldn't figure it out. It was uh, obviously he had to brush up and upskill and study um, whatever part of the medical field to gain that understanding. It's not, this, this is direct application of learning to learn or being a lifelong learner. Um, and so he was able to upskill, learn, apply, uh, and even though it wasn't his field, to figure out what was wrong and then bring that back to the doctors where he could get more help, et cetera, and actually diagnose his son, uh, which I just thought that was amazing. Um, so although there's no one field or no one skill that will solve everything, you're going to find that you're going to get more mileage out of certain fields and being able to understand how to turn a computer on and open up a Word doc and send an email, 
um, will allow you to communicate with millions of people um, versus an underwater basket weaving where I might get some Instagram likes. Great, and Stacey had mentioned the same thing of the 3D printing playing a role in helping her own child. So thank you to all of our panelists because we're at about eight o'clock and uh, this is great to have you and also for like the professionals on this call, uh, often we play a role uh, in kind of doing career mentoring because uh, we might be the only source for a student that has questions. So also thank you again, because uh, uh, events like this also help us uh, give better advice to students that we work with. So next session is going to be May 9th on biology and neuroscience, and May 23rd will be focused on engineering. So the sign-up form that was used for this event uh, can be used for these other events. Uh, so please share with your friends, and we'll once again push out these sessions to uh, career counselors and schools and um, those involved in STEM across North Carolina. So thank you so much to um, Steele, Stacy, David, and Xavier. You had to leave early for being here tonight and sharing your evening uh, with us. And thanks so much for being here and sharing what you do uh, with students. And again, we recorded this uh, so that we have the recording. Uh, and potentially might be able to grab kind of quick sound bites to support other programming we might, we might do in the future. Chris, if any of our panelists know anyone of their colleagues and their networks that they think in those areas would be great panelists for us, please let us know. You guys have been amazing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. All right, and if you want to uh, follow up with any of our panelists, um, uh, if any panelists want to share like LinkedIn contact or anything else, if someone wants to reach out to you, uh, we could end with that. And thank you so much. And if you don't have LinkedIn, um, definitely something I see a lot more high schoolers do. And for middle schoolers, certainly, um, whether your parents, can set up an account or just start writing down names so that when you make an account someday, you can connect with a lot of people quickly. So have a good evening uh, to everyone and uh, we'll hang on for a second if you need to write down something that was in chat, but otherwise have a good night.